And we should be good to go, I would think. Yeah. Okay, good. Then I'm going to start um, and say welcome everybody out there in the YouTube and Facebook world. Um, my name is Claudia Bornhold. I'm the Dean of the Edwards College of Humanities and Fine Arts. And this is week three of our Edwards College orientation month live discussions. And um, if anybody was able to watch last week's um, discussion, we had um, the social sciences programs represented. This week we're here with the humanities. Um, I should say that not every human humanities discipline in our college is represented today. So I wanna give a shout out to our history department um, and also to um, obviously there's humanities topics and the liberal arts covered throughout other disciplines we have as well. We are here today with the chairs of the Department of English, the Department of Languages and Intercultural Studies and the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. And um, as I mentioned, the humanities are represented in many other departments, but we could only fit three. <laughs> so um, I'm really happy to have these three chairs with me and I wanna start and ask them to introduce themselves to you, give a little history about who they are and how they became a professor and now chair of the humanities department. And, um, and then um, we will move from there and talk a little bit about our discipline. So maybe we start with um, in alphabetical order, I guess the English department. So Joe, why don't you start? Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Joe A. Strike and I'm the chair of the English department. My daughter just dropped off a little dog here. Sorry, but this is the world of Zoom we are all in right now. Um, I'm one of those people who, when I came to college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be. And I imagine that some of you might be kind of in that same boat. I ended up doing an undergraduate in political science. And I went out after I graduated and got a job working for an architecture firm, but I realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to create things. And I love to read and write, but I had no idea that you could learn how to do that much less turn reading and writing into a profession that wasn't like big famous writer like Stephen King or John Grisham. Um, but luckily my wife, who also teaches at the English department, was in graduate school at Ohio State studying literature. And through her, I met some folks that were learning to be creative writers. And I would meet them at cocktail parties or whatever. And I think to myself, you can study creative writing? like. Creative writers aren't just born on some planet where everybody wears black berets and smokes clove cigarettes. Like you can actually learn to do that. Normal people can be creative writers. So I would meet these creative writers. I honestly think to myself, if these bozos can do it, I can do it. So I went to graduate school for creative writing and I learned the craft sort of of creative nonfiction, which is using the tools of fiction and poetry but to tell a true story, stuff that really happened. So um, I ended up writing a book about what it was like to be in a rock and roll band for 30 years and not become famous and uh, got the job here at Coastal teaching students how to do that sort of thing, how to take the real raw material of their lives and turn it into something that is hopefully compelling uh, to a group of writers. So what I do here in the English department is um, we've got a couple different degrees, first of all. We've got the English major, and we've got a major called Digital Culture and Design, which is the same sort of thing, reading and writing, but in the, the digital environment. Uh, we've got a bunch of minors. We've got creative writing, Southern Studies, New Media and Digital Culture, English and Linguistics. But what ties all of this together is analyzing texts, reading texts, producing text. And the cool thing is, whatever you decide to do with your life once you leave Coastal as an English major, there will always be a demand for people who can do that very thing, analyze texts and produce texts. So I think the English major is a very, very exciting place to be. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so happy that um, I ended up going, coming into this field and sort of becoming a writer. And I'm hoping that many of you will come aboard and let us show you how exciting and diverse English studies can be. Great, thank you so much, Professor Strike. So here we have a we have a creative writer here with us today, which is fantastic. Um, 
That's great. We will learn lots more about our English department and our DCD program as well as we go on. So um, let me shift gears and go to um, go to the religious studies, uh, philosophy and religious studies. So go ahead. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your department, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis Earl, and I'm currently the chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies here at Coastal. I've been here since 2002. And how did I become a philosophy professor and chair of the department? That's kind of a long story. Um, I actually started, it's interesting that Joe said he started in political science. Uh, philosophy is similar. People often start in something else and then kind of find philosophy somehow and realize, oh, you can, you can major in that and get all of these exciting things that you've been interested in all along. But I started actually in uh, engineering at NC State. And I did at the time really think that I had it down as to exactly what it is that I wanted to do with myself. My uh, father was an engineer. Um, that's what I wanted to do. From 10th grade on, everything was all set. Um, and I still even now have like the greatest respect for engineering. And I really think that I was thinking about this right before the this discussion, like, would I do it? Would I start out in engineering again? Would I do, would I combine them together? I think what I would do is I would, I would major in philosophy for sure, but I would combine it with something else. And who knows, it, it might have been engineering or math or, or anything. Philosophy kind of lends itself to pairing with just about, just about anything else. But for one reason or another, I, I didn't get so much bored with engineering. It's just the, the sort of narrow calculating kind of aspect of it, as, as good and useful and productive and so on as that is, it wasn't what I was looking to do. It's like I was more interested in what was going on more fundamentally with engineering. Um, you know, engineering is a, it's a bunch of applied science and applied math and so on. So it's like, why is it that I love my, my math classes? and physics classes way better than I do the engineering ones. And then the more things kind of went on, it was more about what was fundamental to those disciplines and so on too, right? So I'd be, I'd be wondering like, like what exactly is a function or a number or what does calculus actually do, right? How does it get us any knowledge of anything? Um, and I think I knew at the time that these were philosophical questions that, had, that I was more interested in than the more practical ones. Um, but like a lot of people, I took a philosophy course, I took another philosophy course, I took another philosophy course, and I kind of benefited from having a good friend who was also in engineering at the time. And we were both kind of going through this sort of soul searching about what to do with ourselves. Um, and we both went to grad school in, in philosophy. I became a professor. Uh, he left and became a lawyer and ultimately an, an environmental consultant. Um, so he went one path, I went, went another, and that's, that's kind of how, how I got here. Um, that's all awesome. Should I add more? No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. We will learn more about the department okay. in a minute. I like this. So now we're all curious how Professor Schmidt's course led him from one discipline to where he ended up because there's a theme here. So, so why don't you go ahead? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Gary Schmidt, Chair of Languages and Intercultural Studies. And yes, I also uh, fit into that, that pattern um, that my uh, colleagues have already described. And so I um, started um, as an undergraduate, I actually had a double major in international relations. That was my first major. And then German was my second major. Um, and I, I majored in German because just because I loved it. Um, not because I ever thought I would do anything with it professionally. I never wanted to become a, a German professor. Um, and as a matter of fact, I... Um, wanted to become a professor of political science, mainly because that's what my father had done, right? So uh, that also is part of my story. Um, and, um, but I wanted to learn German for a couple reasons. One is because my, my last name is Schmidt, so my family heritage is German, uh, but no one spoke it in my family. And I didn't, I, couldn't, I didn't have an opportunity to learn it in high school. So I actually started it in college at the age of 18. And that's one of the, th we often hear this, Myth spread around that if you don't start learning a foreign language as, as a child or, or, or a young adolescent, you can't learn it. Well, that's completely untrue. 
um, and I'm proof of that. And I really wanted to go study abroad in Germany, uh, which I did my junior year in a, this beautiful city called Freiburg in Southwest Germany. Um, and that was a life transforming experience, um, meeting new people, seeing different ways of living, uh, different foods, uh, just in, in living in an environment where you're, you're on a continent where you could just travel, uh, you know, a, a few hours and people are speaking a different language. You can be in a different country, all something that was completely new to me uh, as a, a young uh, guy from the mid from the suburbs of Chicago from the Midwest where you're just thousands of miles from anywhere any other country right so I don't want to go on too long but one of the reasons that um, I uh, never would have thought of pursuing German as part of a career or a German professor becoming a German professor or doing anything with it career wise was because back in the 80s when I was a student things were quite a bit different in terms of the methods of teaching language and, and sort of the, the, the connections that one makes between languages and other areas of uh, professional activity. Well, we didn't really have them back then. Um, so, you know, and learning the language, we sat in the class and we would do grammar exercises and then we would translate things into English. And a lot of students dropped out really quickly, but I stuck it out, I stuck out, stuck with it and learned it, but there was no real um, support in terms of fig figuring out what you could do with the language or make it relevant. So I actually started a program, a doctoral program in political science, but I, I quickly realized that that just wasn't for me. I mean, I think it's a great field for a lot of people, but it just wasn't for me. And at that time I was reading a lot of, I had already studied abroad in Germany as an undergrad, and I was reading a lot of books in German and I realized that I loved literature. And so I'm like, great, I'm going to study German literature. So I went into a PhD program. I became a professor. Well, when I was in my doctoral program, things were probably a little different than they are now, too. And they're starting, they were starting to change. But basically, you had the choice to study linguistics or literature. And that was it. But now the field has changed so much. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But now you can relate your language studies is so many different other areas of study and endeavor, uh, you know, just to name a few, film and media studies, um, uh, gender studies, uh, sustainability studies, or, or if you're, you know, you're a business major or you're a national security major, you can make uh, language relevant to that as well. And that's one of the things we really encourage you to do in the LIS department at Coastal. That's great, wonderful, thank you. Um, danke schön, I guess. <laughs> I gotta, <laughs> gotta give that one away. Um, that's wonderful. So yeah, we will hear a little bit more from, from um, Professor Schmidt about all the different languages we teach as well. But I thought maybe we'll, we'll hand it back to Professor Istrak first and let him tell us a little bit about the many different concentrations and options we heard a little bit already in the English department. And maybe you can tell us a little more about the digital culture and design, which is a very special program we have in our college and here at Coastal Carolina University. So it would be great. Happy to do so. Um, I'm struck as listening to Dr. Schmidt and Earl speak of just how many different twists and turns a life can take and a career can take. And that's one of the things that I really love about the humanities generally is that the humanities provide such a solid base for whatever twist or turn your, your life or career takes. Um, with regards to the English department, I think one of the things that students are surprised to find out is how varied the discipline is. I think there's kind of a misconception with the English major that it's either where you go to become an English teacher in high school, which, which is great, it is one of the places you can go to become an English teacher, or it's the place where you go to read big, fat, dusty books. And there's nothing wrong with that either. There are lots of big, fat, dusty books and we're happy to read them in English, but it's so much more than that. Like Dr. Schmidt was just saying, um, within literature, uh, you can study women's and gender studies. You can study um, all sorts of various literary theories. You can study African-American literature. And it's, it's just really, really broad. So even within the major, just the English major, we have two majors, but just within the English major, there are four different concentrations, creative writing, literature, and culture. And just like Dr. Schmidt was saying, um, it's not just about the books. It's about the books, how the books intersect with real life, with what's going on in, in, in the 
the world. So creative writing, literature and culture, composition and rhetoric, and then the fourth concentration within the English major is just English studies. That's kind of a grab bag, pick any English classes you want and throw them together to create a major. Then also within the English department, we have a second major, which is digital culture and design. And this is really, really an exciting program. It's about as far away from big dusty books as you can imagine. Um, so what we're talking about here, as I said earlier, is analyzing texts and producing texts in the digital space. So we often think of a text as being a book, a piece of writing, but in the DCD program, the text could be code. It could be a video game. It could be a blog, potentially. The text that you're analyzing could be a social media website. So it's all of these sort of the production of text, but text considered broadly into the, the, the realm of the digital. So it's very exciting. There's a special room within the Edwards building, which is the main humanities building on campus called the Digital Commons. It's sort of the, the beating heart of the DCD program. We've got all this cool technology that I probably don't know how to run, um, but it's a very, very exciting space. And English is an exciting place to be because it's so varied. It's a giant, giant tent. And as I said before, what sort of unites it is the creation and production of texts, but it's so much more than just reading old books and wanting to become a high school English teacher. That's all great, but it's so much more than that. Great, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I, I'm a humanist myself <laughs> with a PhD in German, um, but really in medieval literature and historical linguistics. So, and then I've, I've started programs in European studies and I've <laughs> directed programs in multiple other regional area studies in the past. So it's definitely diverse. <laughs> There's many opportunities obviously for this. So um, that's great lots of history involved, lots of, you know, cultural studies involved, lots of social studies involved. So all of that, that's, that's what I think is exciting about the humanities. And um, let's go to the, the heart of the discipline, philosophy, the core in religious studies, the beginnings of university, really of universities and university education. So tell us a little, we have great news coming out of your department, right, Dr. Earl? <laughs> yes. Um... If this interview would have been going on a year ago, I would have only been able to say we have one major and that's the philosophy major, which we've had since, uh, since about 2000 or so. Uh, but just starting up this fall, we're really pleased that we finally have a, a religious studies major that uh, will stand alone. We had had a minor for years and years and years that was, was well, well attended and signed up for. But now we have a major and that's that's making everybody very happy. Um, as far as what those two um, degree programs do, uh, the philosophy major is sort of a standard kind of run of the mill uh, approach to it. Uh, like Joe mentioned for English, philosophy is really broad based. Um, I came to it, as I told you before, uh, from the science end of it, but that's just one smallish kind of piece of it. Sure, you can take philosophy of science or philosophy of language or philosophy of psychology or something rather like that. Um, but ethics is part of philosophy too. Um, how should one live one's life? How should we live together? Um, what sorts of particular kinds of things are right or wrong? There are whole sequences of classes and so on about those. And, and we have some dedicated people who, who study that um, and, and teach in it. Um, we also have a history of philosophy as, as part of what one would study in, in the program. Uh, maybe philosophy is a little bit unique to at least some of the other humanities in that like the, the historical end of it is really much more alive than, than maybe it would be say in, well, I mean, you do political theory in, in politics that would have you read Aristotle or something rather like that. But in philosophy, if you're gonna take, a, say, a class in the theory of knowledge, for instance, uh, you really might start way back with, you know, Plato and Aristotle or even, or even earlier than that. Um, so you've got this long history of texts and so on to be, to be kind of wrestling with uh, in the philosophy major. 
Um, and it all touches on, on everything else. One thing that's, that's nice about it is that, you know, I had my interests in the sort of more science and technology end of it all. But if I didn't, if I were more interested in political philosophy, uh, that's a whole angle that one can, can work with even at the undergraduate level too. It's like, yes, sure, some balance among all of these different things is, is kind of required, but we've got, there's enough freedom in the classes offered and, and what you can do to, to hit all of those things. And I should say something about religious studies too, because um, even though I'm a philosopher, um, one of the best things I can say about being the chair, um, there are good things about being a chair of the department. Um, the, probably the best one is that I get to interact with my religious studies colleagues more and find out what it is that they really get their teeth and minds into and to find out more about that whole side of our, of our house. Because you might think like, what would philosophy and religious studies have to do with each other? It's like one is eminently rational and the other one is eminently sort of faith-based or something like that. You could, you could slice them apart that way if, if you wanted to. And it's true that maybe one of them, okay, focuses on the primacy of reason or something like that. And that's what you could say, all right, well, you will learn your reasoning skills to a very high degree in philosophy. Um, but the same thing actually holds on the religious studies side too. And because you have all of these difficult traditions to kind of work through, whether you're just sort of interested in them as like an anthropologist would be, or if you're interested in them by way of trying to find out more about one's own religious beliefs, people come to religious studies for all kinds of different reasons. But you've got a lot of the same kinds of difficult things to work through and reason about and write about and talk about and empathize towards and so on that you have uh, on the philosophy side. And there's another thing too that kind of links the two together that I never really appreciated until actually probably only about two years ago or, or so. And it's that as different as sometimes the two fields are, they actually are at root getting at a lot of the same questions. Because I mentioned that ethics is a, an important part, for instance, of philosophy, but all the great religious systems that one might study, they've got something to say about how you ought to live too, and how people ought to live in, in groups and so on. And they have their reasons and so on. Sometimes, yes, it involves supernatural motivations and so forth, but you do have a lot of the same kinds of deep fundamental questions that people are, are just gonna take to be important no matter what age you happen to be in. And that's been really nice to have these kinds of conversations across the two sort of sides. I hate to even call them sides because we are, you know, we're all in this, in this together. So those are the two majors and we have, uh, uh, you didn't ask, or uh, Dr. Bornholt didn't ask about minors, but we have minors in philosophy, we have a minor in religious studies, we have another minor in uh, Islamic studies that's proven to be very popular. Uh, we also have medical humanities, sort of timely given our unfortunate situation with the, the epidemic and so on. There are a whole um, sort of philosophy and ethics of public health kinds of questions to really get into uh, to say nothing about policy and so forth uh, also. Uh, but that's, that's a nice program uh, that's housed with us too. Great, yes, thank you. Thanks for bringing up the minors, obviously. Good, well then let's learn a little bit more about the many <laughs> options the, the LIS department has, um, the many languages we can learn and also the degree program. Thank you, Dr. Bornholt. So we are pleased to be able to offer now seven languages in our department. So they are Arabic, Chinese, French, German, Italian, <laughs> French, German, Italian, Russian, and Spanish. And uh, Arabic having been, uh, well, no, actually Chinese is the most recent edition. And um, I should say that, um, okay, so of those languages, you could you can take coursework, but you can apply that coursework to either a major or a minor. So we have a major in languages and intercultural studies with two concentrations. So one concentration is called Hispanic studies, in which you focus in terms of your language um, acquisition uh, exclusively on Spanish, but also do coursework in culture. But if you want to do uh, to study more than one language or primarily another language besides Spanish, then you can you can select the multiple languages option uh, concentration. 
and uh, is very flexible. So let's say you wanna study um, German and Chinese, for example. That may seem like an unusual combination, but actually it, it would be, I think, a pretty good one in many ways. Um, so you can, uh, we offer flexibility and that you can sort of, uh, you, you choose one primary language and one secondary language. So in your primary language, you would do more coursework than in your secondary language. But the, the sort of proportion between the two is, is more or less up to you. Uh, you could do about 80% of your coursework in German and 20% in Chinese, or you could get closer to something like 60%, 40%. Um, and also we're just flexible. We can do some substitutions too if you wanna all, almost make it an even split, right? And this is actually, um, um, a best practice now, sort of the Modern Language Association, which is our professional organization, really encourages uh, students to learn more than one foreign language and to make connections um, across different languages. So I guess one of the things I wanna emphasize is that in addition to being a department where we teach specific languages, we're also teaching you skills of language learning in general. How do you become a competent learner of foreign languages? And once you've learned one language, you're acquiring, it's going to be easier to learn another one. And I can say that from personal experience. So the first foreign language I uh, uh, er, learned was German. And that's really helped me in my various endeavors to learn other languages along, along the way. And um, so we focus, another thing that I think is really important is that we focus not just on language learning, language acquisition, but also culture, right? So getting to know another culture and having a critical, uh, critical perspective, but also uh, as much of an insider perspective as you can have, not having been raised in that culture, you really have to uh, have competency in the language because language influences also the way we think. Right. So in a diff different languages have different concepts. They divide up the world differently in a way. There are different, you know, the, the, con the, the when you say the word house in English or the word house in German, which sounds exactly the same, although spelled differently, um, you're going to have a different image. The German speaker will have a different image than the, the American uh, would have. Right. And that's just one example. You uh, different languages are associated with different national traditions, different histories. You know, how do we talk about history? How do we talk about politics? How do we talk about the environment? So to have an insight into all of those things, you really need to know the language. And then if you want to really make your language uh, knowledge proficiency useful, we really encourage you to tie that to study in another area. So that's why the major is very flexible. We encourage double majors. Um, and maybe a little later on, I can get in this program, I can give you some examples of some of the things our students have done in terms of double majors. Um, and we also um, have minors. So we have, so say you don't have enough room in your schedule to do a full languages and intercultural studies major, you could do a minor in German, French, Spanish, or languages and intercultural studies, which is basically kind of a minor that you create on your own. You could say you wanna do Chinese primarily. So then you do as much language coursework as you can in Chinese. And then we will look for culture courses either in or outside the department that you can count to complete that minor. Uh, and now I also would like to announce that we are now gonna be offering starting next year, uh, a Spanish for health professions uh, minor. So another way that you can uh, tie uh, your knowledge of a specific language to a specific career opportunity. Great, thank you. Yes, and we will hear a little bit more about some of the other interdisciplinary connections between the programs we have, which is great. So why don't you just continue a little bit, um, Dr. Schmidt, and tell us what your students are combining and doing with their degree. The, okay, sure. Thank you. Great. Yep. Um, so for example, I've had a number of students um, that I've advised or, or even worked with, have them in some of my classes who have done Russian and national security studies. 
uh, intelligence and national security studies, for example. Um, obviously, Russian is, uh, so we, uh, we should talk about this notion of critical languages that um, the US government has designated certain languages being critical for national security. And the, 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 the great thing about that is that there's money going into that. So we have, we have um, uh, Russian, those, those, the languages that are, have been designated critical in our department are Chinese, Russian, and Arabic. And so that there are opportunities that exist, for example, for uh, scholarships that are fully funded for study abroad, the critical language program, the Bourne Awards, those sorts of things. So those are of interest to students who are going into not just national uh, intelligence and security, but also into uh, diplomatic professions or other forms of government service, or are looking to work for non-governmental organizations, um, non-for-profits, or even, even students going in and doing something, uh, you know, working for um, do, doing mission work or something like that, for example, is also an option. Peace Corps would be another option. So those are some of the things. We've also had a number of students doing business. Um, from my, since I'm a professor of German, I know that a lot of the students, uh, I have a couple double majors doing German and business, and they've had great opportunities in finding internships with German owned companies. So there are like, there are literally hundreds of German owned companies in the Southeast. So I've had students do internships in Atlanta or elsewhere in South Carolina. And those companies are really interested in hiring, um, uh, having interns, but also hiring individuals who have knowledge of the language and of the culture. And recently I had a student uh, who, who worked for as an intern for a, an importer of a machinery in Atlanta. And he actually had to, you know, he had to use his German. He had to catalog, he had to translate uh, what was coming in. And then he had to actually talk um, to colleagues in Germany on the phone as well. And so that was a great opportunity for him. And those opportunities exist in all, in all the languages that we have. I mean, there are, there are French owned companies, Chinese owned companies that, that are, you know, this is the era of globalization and uh, having the, the knowledge of another language and cultural insights is a real advantage to you um, when you wanna seek uh, professional opportunities. That's great, wonderful. Well, then let's move to English and share a little bit the success stories of our English majors and minors. That, where are they going? Because I know, I'm sure you get that question a lot. What do you do with the English major after graduation? <laughs> You're mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mute. We do have a lot of students who go on to become teachers. Many of them teach in the public schools. We have a lot of students who go on to graduate school and then they end up teaching at the university level. But one of the things I think is really exciting about a new program we've got here now, we just started it last year. It's called the English Futures Speakers Series. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. But what we do is we bring in people either through on-campus visits or a video platform to talk to our current students. And these folks are professionals who are doing something other than teaching because we figure that our students get to see teachers teaching, they get to see English professors in action all the time. They need to see other folks who are out in the world using their English degree to sort of get them going in a career. So we had an alum who currently works for Blue Sky Animation Studios. Uh, they're up in Connecticut and they're the production studio that did um, Spies in Disguise was one of their newest ones. They did the Ice Age series. And this alum is a production assistant for Blue Sky Animation Studios. And so she talked to our students about how to get into that industry and how her English degree set her along her path. We've had branding strategists, digital strategists, people from advertising, people from law. We've had judges. And so one of the cool things that, that I thought of as I'm sitting there watching all of these people present to our students, I'm thinking, okay, here's what's cool about an English degree. In every sort of industry, there's like the primary thing that the company does. So like, let's say we're talking about Stanley Tools, okay? There are people at Stanley Tools who make hammers, okay? but you do not have to be a hammer maker to work at Stanley Tools. As a matter of fact, for every person who designs hammers, there are probably a hundred people that help the business work. And those people need to be able to communicate, 
through the wit written word or orally. They need to be able to analyze spreadsheets, market conditions. They need to be able to think creatively. They need to be able to tell stories pretty much in any, whether you're in politics, law, any industry, you need to be able to tell a story. And so I think that these skills that we teach in the English department, and we tend to think, oh, I can become a high school English teacher. We need tons of great high school English teachers. But I really think that these skills are applicable across almost any industry I can think of. Even accounting, probably. You need to tell a story with those numbers. That's great. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, then let's let's um, hear from the degree in philosophy and religious studies. Well, religious studies is brand new. We don't have a graduate with a major in religious studies quite yet, but let's, let's hear a little bit from um, Dr. Earl. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one thing I just want to second and, and emphasize what uh, Joe and Gary have have hit on already. And that's just how broadly applicable some of these degrees that we're talking about here today really are. Um, and we don't have history and politics uh, with us, but, but it holds for them and, and communication and, and all of the arts too. And I think people sometimes don't think about that, like the sort of question I get, you know, from people with philosophy is, okay, well, what do you do with that? Like, you just go sit on a hill somewhere and think about it. So, well, if you're independently wealthy, of course, you, you could do that. But, but most of us have to be gainfully employed. And if you kind of listen to how these different programs talk about themselves, you're going to get the same kinds of themes. You're going to hear about broad skills that when you think hard about it, it is what it's the collection of skills that the employers want. So excellent reading skills, excellent writing skills, excellent communication skills, excellent analytical skills, where it doesn't matter really what the context is, as long as you kind of get up on what the content is, then those general skills can kick in. And that's where you get to be more valuable than people who have very narrow focuses on on things, not that there's anything wrong with that, obviously, but um, it turns out. Well, just as an example, they um, the the American Association of Colleges and Universities. There, I didn't even have to look it up right then. Uh, they did these employer surveys in uh, 2012 and 2015, I believe, and they interviewed all of these human resources people and executives and so on. And, and the question is, look, what is it the college graduates need today that maybe you're not seeing as much of as, as you would want. And it's the list that I, that I just sort of rattled off that, I, that I've heard from, from Joe and Gary. It's like, can you speak clearly? Can you write clearly? Can you end text? Can you summarize it? Can you sit in a meeting, meeting and think on your feet and get along with everybody and, and work together to solve problems and so on? And what's sort of weird and very cool about philosophy is that even though you're you're you really got your head in you know these deep questions like whether we have free will or what uh, you know whether there are abstract entities in addition to the physical ones and and all of these sorts of things and difficult questions in ethics and moral philosophy and all of that all of that exercising of your mind carries over to all of these other other things. So like you don't major in philosophy necessarily to become a philosopher, though that's great, or at least I hope it is because, you know, here I am. Um, but you do it so that you can do like whatever it is that you want to do and to do it better. I've got a colleague, he, the way he uh, talks about it, he says, look, philosophy's best part about philosophy is that it'll help you do whatever it is that you do way better than you would have before. Right. And the same holds for the, the other humanities too. like why double major in English or why add a language degree or something like that. It's because the, the skills you're going to get from that in addition to the content, it's, it's going to carry over into whatever it is that you wind up doing. And what will you wind up doing? I did take the liberty of looking something up before we before we met. And my question to to uh, to the Google universe was how many times do people change careers over the course of a lifetime? And the answer is five to seven. Like whole changes in careers with new content to learn, new people to meet, 
new things to do, but the skills are like the same for success in all of those. It's all of that good thinking skills rolled together that you get in any of the humanities. And then of course, since I'm selling philosophy, it's like, okay, you, you definitely get the thinking part um, in philosophy. They even said like before you turn 40, if you just do jobs, cause we all had jobs when we were 18 and so on, right? Those go in the mix. Uh, uh, they say 10 on average, your average person has 10 different jobs before they're 40. And then five to seven complete career changes over a lifetime. So yeah, you can be narrowly focused and that's, that's awesome. Uh, you, you know a lot in that, in that area, but the humanities offer all of this sort of broad kind of, kind of stuff that's gonna carry over no matter what you do. And it's, it's kind of an unfortunate thing to mention as a plug right now for the humanities, but we're in a world where what is it? What's the unemployment rate these days as we do this in June of 2020? You know, it's, it's 15 to 30%, depending on what part of the country you're, you're actually in. So lots of people are changing jobs and they're gonna wind up doing different things and they're gonna have this collection of abilities that they have to apply no matter what it is that they do. It's gonna turn out to be fine, but how are you gonna, gonna land, I guess would be the question, all right? And you get all this from, that's, that's from the philosophy side. Um, what kinds of jobs I'm going on too long? Uh, the quick answer is, is anything, but just for what people have recently double majored in, that was part of the question too. Uh, we have a person who's with languages uh, with Gary right now who's double majoring. Uh, uh, English is a very popular double major, or at least has, has been in, in recent years. We've got one or two in the mix right now. Uh, in the sciences, psychology is a very popular double with us. Um, but we've, we've had most of them where it's feasible to do so. If there's enough by way of electives or cognate minor requirement hours to play with, We've got it built in for philosophy and for religious studies, both where like the second major is, is something that's definitely feasible if you start out kind of with the, with the game plan uh, to do it. Uh, who else? We had, we've had music. Uh, we had uh, somebody who's, who's a very talented musician, a classical guitarist, but he also majored in philosophy uh, with us. And then he, it, it's a long story as to how these combine together, but he's going off to architecture grad school uh, in the fall to combine his sort of analytical side with his aesthetic side uh, to, to, to do architecture. That's, that's great. Uh, we also have somebody in art studio now who's, who's double majoring. Um, recently for, for what, for uh, uh, internships, uh, we're a little late in having lots of people go to those, but that's in the last couple of years, we've had more and more people do it. Uh, we had somebody do an environmental law uh, internship. She got to go to Greece. I was very jealous, uh, you know, for Western philosophy, you know, Greece, that's the place you want to go um, to see where it all happened. Um, we've had, uh, there's a guy in Washington right now doing an internship with the Washington Intern Internship Institute. And that's a policy um, internship, I think. Uh, we've had uh, people do local things. Uh, Lots of stuff with, with internships. As far as jobs in grad school goes, I mean, uh, I should mention law school because a lot of people do sort of find themselves advised or attracted to philosophy because, okay, they do really well on the LSAT. So that's, that's what I'll do. And, and it's true that philosophy majors do better on that than lots of other, other majors. But I mean, don't major in philosophy just because of the LSAT scores, because I mean, it might very well be that the same people who gravitate to philosophy also are the same people who do well in the LSAT. Um, but people do. Uh, and we have, we have plenty of lawyers out there who are, who are graduates uh, all around the country. We've had people do MBA programs. Uh, one of my advisees, uh, he, was, he was actually one of the football players, but uh, he went to med, med school afterwards. Uh, and I haven't caught up with him uh, in a while, but I think that all, all turned out. So kind of like I was saying at the beginning, if, you, if you're talking broad thinking skills that apply to anything, it would make sense that any kind of career would sort of fit with, with philosophy if you play it, play it right, and, and we've seen that. Great, so that, 
thank you. That's so much information already. I wonder, listening to you, it just occurred to me that, of course, all three of your departments are heavily involved in our general education on campus and the core. So you're all supplying essential courses to the core. I would say every student at Coastal Carolina University definitely sets foot <laughs> often more than once in, in one of your departments, actually, I guess in all three of them, if I'm thinking about it. So maybe we can talk a tiny bit about the kind of support we offer students in the, you know, I'm thinking the, the English 101 students or the students in language classes. Um, and also, I think people would love to hear a little about what do your students do in extracurricular activities? What are opportunities connected to their degrees, you know, clubs or, you know, we heard a little about internships already, but anything, you know, just to round out the picture of someone who's coming in and thinks, oh, I want to be a English major, or I want to be studying Arabic, or, you know, just maybe, um, maybe we start with English again. So. Yeah, so we do teach a lot of students at Coastal, as you said, Dean Warhol, pretty, pretty much all of them, because you've got to take English 101 and 102, and I think that's just testament to how important society and not just the university, but the world thinks that reading and writing is. We make every student take the classes. Um, our, our, the way we teach 101 and 102 is really sort of revolutionary. We have four credit hour classes instead of three in 101 and 102. And the fourth credit hour is what we call a digital badge component, where we really isolate specific discrete skills that students need to know, like research or shifting styles a way to think about different levels of discourse. And we make sure that students master those specific skills on their own, in addition to applying them to the research papers that they're doing. So that's sort of what gives you the support to really make sure you understand what's going on before you move on to the next level. In addition to 101 and 102 in the core, we have 201, which is an intro to create a writing class. We have 205, which is a literature and culture class. We've got very exciting themes with those classes, on the job in America, for instance, or um, the Afro-Latian poets, which a bunch of, of African-American poets who work, lived in Appalachia. We typically don't think of that combination, but um, really cool um, uh, theme for that course. So we also have an intro to linguistics course as well. But one of the things that we're really concerned about in the English department is, Oftentimes students don't get into our 300 and 400 level classes until late in their sophomore year or maybe in their junior year. And we wanna make sure that students from the very first semester feel at home in our department. Think of our department as one of their homes away from home. And so what we do is we, we really wanna make sure that freshmen are invited into the community. And so that means attending readings, poetry readings, fiction readings by visiting authors. That means attending these English Future Speaker Series events that I mentioned before. It means contributing to various contests and awards that we have from sort of like best 101 essay competition to uh, the Paul Rice Broadside Contest, which is the best, the prize for the best poem written by a coastal undergraduate. So we really wanna make sure that students are participating in the life of the, part of the department from the first day they set foot on campus. Later, they'll be able to join groups like Sigma Tau Delta, which is the Honor Society for English. And it allows students to sort of form their own community and do student-centered and student-managed um, events. But we really do try to go out of our way to make sure that everybody's welcome early even if it seems like it's going to take you three or four semesters before you really get into the meat of the major. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we should mention the writing center, of course, we have that's available for all our students on campus. And for the language side, we have the Foreign Language Instructional Center. I think that's the name, <laughs> if I got this correct. So another one, resource we have, of course, available for everybody on campus. And then the peer, we have the peer tutors and um, for our students as well. So um, let's hear a little bit about the, the languages and intercultural studies activities or you know, students, extracurricular activities students are engaged in. Yes, absolutely. Um... And if, before I answer your question, if I might just uh, take one minute to, to uh, build on something that uh, Dennis 
uh, had said, which I think was really important. I'm glad he brought up the AACU and their studies that, um, and these skills that are broadly applicable. I think a couple other that we should mention that, um, are, that we're all involved in. I think the, the Edwards College of Humanities and Fine Arts is the college where this is gonna happen for you is uh, interdisciplinary skills and um, diversity, equity and inclusion. I think these are really important topics right now that you're able to in your professional careers to collaborate with people from different backgrounds, whether they studied something different than you did, or whether they come from, a, they grew up speaking a different language, or they have a different, they identify different in terms of an ethnic or racial or national community, or, or, or gender. And we're all really involved in these sorts of um, um, uh, initiatives here. So uh, th this is the place for that. Um, so getting to the question now, uh, extracurricular activities and language. We have um, a number of very active conversation and uh, student clubs. Uh, this year, for example, the German club was very active. The Chinese club was extremely active and they even organized events for the community on campus. Um, we've had an Arabic club. We had a lucky to have a member of the community come and work with students on um, aspects of Arabic culture and language. Um, we have conversation groups in French and Spanish as well. Um, we have a number of series speakers, um, film series that we organize. Uh, we try to uh, keep in top uh, to make these things relevant also for current events. A few years ago, we organized a panel on um, immigration. Uh, my colleague, uh, Barbara Gasquet in Spanish organized a series called the Unspoken Series, which was focusing on um, uh, bringing in representatives from different cultures uh, who live in the area. For actually, there was a wonderful program on Venezuela, as you know, that's a country that's been in the news a lot. Um, we also organize yearly now, we've done this two years in a row, something called High School Language Day, where we bring in students from local high schools and we uh, give them little uh, micro immersion experiences in different languages. And we talk to them about all sorts of different opportunities that exist for language learners. And we involve our students, our majors in that. Uh, they, they, or, they serve as guides, they organize programs, they assist the faculty in conducting some of these programs. Um, I should also definitely mention, uh, well, a couple other things. Um, uh, we have faculty advisors. So after your, I think starting with your second year uh, it, as a major in our program, you'll be given a faculty advisor. So there we have close relations between faculty and students. And also we, we sponsor, um, I think it's now four different study, uh, faculty-led study abroad programs. So two for Spanish, uh, that those programs alternate between Spain and Costa Rica. And we have a program now uh, in Berlin. Um, and we also have um, a program uh, uh, in Italy, which uh, works together with other departments in the college in an interdisciplinary way. And that's, that's varied between, I think, music and uh, theater. Uh, and next time, I'm not sure, I don't remember at the moment who it's gonna be. But um, those are the sorts of things that you, you can be involved in. But we also provide support for you to look for longer term independent uh, study abroad exchange programs. And we work with our uh, office for uh, our Center for Global Engagement to do so. We have partner universities and other providers of programming. So um, I've advised a number of students on those opportunities and will continue to do so um, in the future. That's great. So many opportunities. I, I'm just remembering we should maybe mention some of our centers as well and institutes. So we have the Jackson Family Center that um, is closely affiliated with the, with the Department on Philosophy and Religious Studies. So maybe you could give us a little <laughs> quick introduction to that center. That would be really great because that does the, the students in the center do a lot of outreach also to high schools. They do the ethics bowl and all this, right? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, that's probably our department's main connection to extracurricular activities, though uh, we do have a philosophy club that's, that meets for informal discussions and so on, where okay, somebody from the department might uh, lead or present on something that they, that they, they are interested in writing about and, and you have a big discussion. Um, we should probably, uh, we'll be having a religious studies club since we have the religious studies major starting up. Uh, but we did already have a Japanese club 
and sort of informal kind of off the books gatherings uh, amongst, you know, as many as like five to 10 people sort of regularly um, to talk about religious studies and Asian studies in, in particular. One of my colleagues is, is particularly magnetic. As far as that, the generating those kinds of, kinds of student discussions, um, but uh, that's in the departments. The Jackson Center for Ethics and Values, that's um, a biggish organization that we have housed in the college, college that's very generously supported by uh, some local benefactors. Um, and we've had that in place for, for quite a while. And as far as student opportunities go, those revolve around a program called the Jackson Scholars Program and one interviews to be admitted into this program. Uh, it's a sort of small number of people, but it varies in size depending on who they see in the pool that looks like they would, they would be good for the program. Um, there's a special sort of curriculum that the Jackson Scholars follow. They have a, a standalone class for them each semester in the two years that they go through. Uh, it ends with one on leadership, Somewhere uh, early on is an in, or early on is an introduction to ethics course that's taught by faculty in the housed in the in the, the center uh, and in between there's a I think it's contemporary moral issues is the class that the ethics bowl is housed in and the ethics bowl is a sort of team competition among uh, colleges where I think the way the format goes unless they've changed it recently is that you imagine a whole bunch of uh, ethical issues or moral dilemmas that are sort of given to you ahead of time. And then you go out and do all the homework and practice to sort of get at, at all the different facets of the, of the problem, uh, what opposing sides might have to say uh, for and against their own positions. And then you're assigned in, you know, on the spot, you know, both the, the issue to talk about and the side to, to defend. And it's this, this friendly competition among among the institutions um, and the students like it. It's an awful lot of work, but you get a lot of that kind of quick thinking uh, combined with, you know, deep research uh, kinds of skills that you, you'd get from something like that. The Jackson Scholars do other things with other institutions too that are more collaborative. They uh, get together or have gotten together with similar groups from uh, South Carolina schools to just have sort of collaborative discussions about, you know, whatever the issues happen to be that, that touch on them in the world today. Um, what else do they do? They, uh, they have some sort of trip that they go on to Chicago, I think recently is where they've gone because the director is from, got his PhD from the University of Chicago, so he has contacts there. Uh, they also uh, help out with the Jackson Center's programming by way of uh, the speakers that they bring to campus. There's a visiting ethicist, for instance, that is uh, always some sort of a nationally recognized figure in the field of philosophical ethics. Uh, it comes and spends time with them and gives a public talk um, and so forth. Uh, so that's really great. That's like the arm of the department that's, that like has the, 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 the opportunities for extracurriculars kind of kind of built into it. Uh, I should say that for all three of us and all the other humanities too, the, the college has the Edwards Research Fellows program that uh, I think all of us today have had some students represented in uh, from time to time. And that's, um, that's a nice opportunity to pursue too. Maybe Dr. Bornholt could talk about that some, but I think that's, that's, that covers the extracurriculars for, for us. That's great. Yeah, we're going to have the, the, the last program in June. We're going to talk a lot more about all of these kind of joint programs, the interdisciplinary ventures. So I'm going to talk a lot about the research fellows as well. But um, I, want to, I want to preserve a little time. We're almost at the one hour mark. And that went so fast, if you ask me. <laughs> so, so I think maybe we can do a quick little, um, what did we forget to mention? I know I, I want to talk briefly about our master's programs we have, but also I want to give um, everyone a chance to share some of the good news because we have some good news in our departments. We have some new faculty coming in. And I think um, that would be a nice opportunity. So maybe, um, maybe Professor Oestreich can start and um, 
And then um, I think Dr. Schmidt has had an intranet malfunction, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do his. <laughs> I'm gonna speak for his department, which is my own department too. So, so maybe we start with English and some good news, and maybe talk a little bit about your graduate program. That would be great. Yeah. How about if I do a little graduate program spiel, talk about some new faculty hires, and then a closing anecdote that I just thought of. Okay. Um, so what, what's cool about our program here at Coastal is that in addition to our two undergraduate majors, English and Digital Culture and Design, we also have a master's degree and it's an MA in writing. So that's writing construed broadly. So a lot of our students are interested in creative writing, but not exclusively. Some of our students are interested in composition and rhetoric. Some of them are in interested in business and professional writing. But I'd say about half, at least, of the students are interested in creative writing, fiction, poetry, or nonfiction. And the great thing about the program is, if you apply for and are awarded a graduate teaching assistantship, you can assist one of our professors in teaching classes. And then the wages that you make for helping, for being the assistant in teaching the undergraduate classes, that pays for your graduate education. So I think the ability to get a master's degree in writing something that you may love to do or at least recognize as a valuable skill and not go into debt in order to do it. So to get a master's degree, and if you, if you combine the master's degree with what we call the degree in three program here at Coastal, you can essentially get a master's degree after just four and a half years of study. And if you can get one of these graduate assistantships and get that to pay for your graduate education and not go into debt, you're really going to be in a good place after, after four and a half or, or five years or, or potentially six if you do the four undergrad and two for the grad program. So that's really exciting. We also have two outstanding faculty members joining us in the fall. We've got Tabitha Lowry, who will be a specialist in African-American literature. She's going to be teaching one of the graduate classes I mentioned before, the uh, graduate class in American literature. She's going to be teaching our African American literature class. She's going to be teaching an English 205, which is the literature course that's in the core. Then we also have a new professor, Emily Brooks, who's primarily going to be teaching in the DCD program. She considers herself a makeademic, meaning that her scholarly response to issues is to make things, which is really exciting. 3D objects in the world. So games and, and book reproductions and things like that, that are actually sort of almost like craft projects, but academic craft projects. So she's gonna be teaching uh, primarily in the DCD program for us in the fall. Then just in the way of a closing anecdote, I was thinking of something as uh, my colleagues were speaking about just how applicable these humanities degrees are, especially when it's time to get a job. It reminded me of a friend of mine who was an English major when I was an undergrad studying political science. She was studying English. A couple years after we both graduated, she was looking for a job. And she told me that she had a job interview at sort of a techie type company. And I said, how did the job interview go? And she said, well, they asked me about this specific technological application that I didn't know how to use. I'd never even heard of it before. And I was like, oh my God, what did you do? She goes, well, they asked me the question. They said, do you know how to run XJ4Q, whatever it was? And she thought for a second and she goes, no, I don't. But that's just learning things. I'm great at learning things. And I think that's what we teach here in the humanities is we teach you how to learn things. And that's why I think these degrees are so important and impactful and helpful during college and beyond college as you set off uh, and start a career. That's great. Thank you. That's that's very great. I'm I'm using I'm using this a lot during this current pandemic and all the change we've had and what we're, we're seeing right now. And I'm always praising everybody in the college for that adaptability and creativity and ability to problem solve and, and kind of deal with the situation as it presents itself, because I think that is the skill we all have with degrees in the liberal arts, right, in the sciences and in the arts. So having, having this combination of humanities and arts scholars, all the, the analytical skills, the creative skills, the, the 
ability to really adapt to situations is, is very, very important. So your example demonstrates that very well. So, but I wanna, I wanna share the good news. I wanna let uh, Dr. Earl share, share the good news from, from his department as well about the new faculty coming in. So. Yes, uh, before I do that, I'll just mention one, I'll try to be quick, but I'll mention one, one thing that we at least provide some support for as far as graduate programs go. We don't have a standalone grad program, of course, in our, our department, but a lot of people who are in the Masters in Liberal Studies program wind up, if they're interested, say they came out of philosophy or religious studies and they want more of that to build in or blend in with their, their master's degree programming, we've helped them out in various ways with that by having not like a big seminar class, but individualized sort of independent study types of things where, okay, if you want to do, I'll use uh, one of my students as an example, you, know, you want to do some a grad level class in personal identity, like what the self is and some different theories of that. And, you know, what, what is it that makes me, me, uh, much less me, the same person from one time to the next and, and all of these interesting things. Um, well, I, I worked with him, it's like you, you spin up some kind of class and then it's all very flexible with the, with the master's program to take these kinds of individual things and blend them together into the, the master's program. And so that's, that's been nice to work with people on those, those kinds of things. Uh, and my religious studies colleagues have done similar things, including one, one thesis um, last semester before last, I think, for the, the MAUS program as we call it. Um, but the news on, uh, on new people, um, we are have very pleased to have a new person coming in in philosophy. Her name is Emily McGill, and she does ethics and political philosophy and feminist philosophy. And we're very glad to have her join our existing ethics faculty to, to bolster that uh, more than it already is. Uh, so that'll be nice. She should be uh, getting here sometime over the summer. And we hope it's not a done deal just yet, but we hope to have a, a new person in religious studies too. Uh, we've been hoping to hire someone with specialized, dedicated expertise uh, in Christianity and this, you know, the academic study thereof. And uh, if that all goes well, we'll have her joining our, our two colleagues that we have already um, in that side of the department. That's great, wonderful. Good, I'm, I'm gonna step in for Dr. Schmidt because we have a few storms rolling through, <laughs> I guess, our, our area right now. So he's, he, he kind of got disconnected, but um, the big news in the, in the department of LIS is that we're hiring a full-time tenure track um, colleague faculty member in Arabic. So, which will allow us to really offer Arabic courses. We've been offering Arabic courses for the kind of one or two semesters, but it allow us to offer more advanced courses and really build up a solid program. And we hope this will feed into our, um, especially our students in intelligence and national security majors, but also in our programs in Middle Eastern studies. And, um, and, and in general, in general, it's really important language for us to teach and have represented amongst our faculty. And then the other news, um, Dr. Schmidt mentioned already the new um, minor in Spanish for health professions, which is very important for us to have. I had two Spanish majors, three, I had three students actually um, last year in the Dean's office as interns and they worked on adapting and translating several of our like materials on the website and recruitment materials into Spanish just so we reach really a broader linguistic base. Um, of our community here with materials. So I hope we can continue that as well. So that's some of the news. We have a number of new programs, but again, I'm telling everyone, check back in in two weeks. We talk about lots of these new interdisciplinary programs here. So, um, so that's a lot of news. The same thing, the MALS, the, um, the Master in Liberal Studies, Dr. Schmidt will be the coordinator of this graduate program starting in August. So. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well on in two weeks. <laughs> so, um, but this is again, it's deeply interdisciplinary, and we have students from really all backgrounds um, doing interdisciplinary coursework with faculty across really our arts and our arts, social science, and humanities disciplines. Actually, so that's really great. So I want to just thank everyone. We've had a, we I think it was a great discussion. I hope people 
what happened in the past. A lot of people just watched the watched our discussion after the fact. But I'm always encouraging everyone if you watch it on YouTube or Facebook to leave us questions. We get back to you. Um, you will find our three chairs on the website. You can also always email the, the college, of course, the dean's office in the college, and we will answer your questions on any of our programs. Um, orientation continues next week, Tuesday. We are going to talk at, again at 2 p.m. We will talk about uh, our arts programs. We have the chairs from our visual arts um, theater and music department with us here. In the evening, I'm doing a session for families, for family orientation. So lots more opportunity to ask us questions. And um, thank you, everyone. Lots of good news coming out of the college, which is great. And we hope to have a lot, large, large group of new students join us. And um, it just occurred to me also, all three departments are representing our three main academic buildings we're, re we're representing in the college. So I feel like we have we have the whole college represented here today in our little session. So that's great. So thanks again. Um, contact us with questions. And um, thanks to um, Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Earl and Professor Ustrak for being here with us. And more soon. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>